MIT Grand Challenges Summit. My name is Chris Berg. I'm the director of the MIT Libraries, and along with my colleague Micah Altman, we're the co-principal investigators of and instigators of this uh, this summit. Um, and so, welcome. This is a uh, a summit designed to identify grand challenges in information science and scholarly communication in three broad areas. We covered already uh, this week, we've covered scholarly discovery and digital curation and preservation. And for the next day and a half, we're going to uh, identify, not solve, but identify some grand challenges in open scholarship and start to develop a research agenda to uh, get some traction and, and on solving some of those. Uh, grand challenges in open scholarship. Um, we have gathered for this summit uh, experts from across many, dona many domains, many locations, many social roles, um, and we're going to spend a lot of time getting to know one another and, and getting to uh, the point where we develop an idea of what the challenges are from multiple points of view. And so I look forward to our conversations here in the room as well as our conversations remotely. This keynote will be live streamed, um, and we hope also that it will be live tweeted by those of you who are so inclined. The hashtag is MIT Grand Challenges, um, so we ask you to join us there if that's your uh, uh, predilection. So, um, again, welcome to all of you. We will start this session on open scholarship um, with a keynote from my friend and colleague, Joey Ito who will be introduced by my other friend and colleague, Helen Bailey. Good morning. So Chris introduced me as her colleague, which is true. I work in the libraries at MIT. But I also currently work at the MIT Media Lab on a project called the Public Library Innovation Exchange which aims to build collaboration between media lab researchers and public libraries across the country. This project is possible because today's keynote speaker believes in the value of libraries. And in fact, libraries and the Media Lab have a common goal, to support an open, collaborative environment where learning can flourish. As the director of the Media Lab and a professor of the practice in media arts and sciences, Joey Ito is no stranger to grand challenges. The Media Lab's vision is itself a a better future. But what is a better future, and how do we know we're working towards it? In his 2016 book, Whiplash, co-authored with Jeff Howe, Joey described nine organizing principles for navigating a future that is tumultuous and unpredictable. These include resilience, risk, and responsible disobedience, and are among the many concepts that Joey emphasizes as a leader, encouraging the Media Lab community to embrace these ideas in their work. And Joey's ideas and impact extend far beyond the output of the lab. He's also a serial entrepreneur who helped start and run numerous companies, including one of the first web companies in Japan, Digital Garage, and the first commercial internet service provider in Japan. He's a member of more boards and advisory committees than I have time to list, and has been an early stage investor in companies that radically changed our online social experience, including Flickr, Twitter, and Kickstarter. In recognition of his impressive contributions to the world of science and technology innovation, he has received numerous awards and honorary doctorates. But perhaps most relevant to our challenge today, he has long been an advocate of internet freedom and open scholarship. Joey was previously the chairman and CEO of Creative Commons, and his article in the first issue of the Media Lab's Open Access Journal of Design and Science highlights the important roles that libraries, publishers, and the entire academic community have to play in opening up intellectual discourse. I'm really excited to hear his thoughts today, and I hope you'll all join me in giving a big welcome to Joey Ito. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if uh, uh, Chris joining the MIT is what caused this uh, sort of situation where you have a person without a college degree lecturing you on scholarship. But, um, <laughs> but I will try my best. Um, <laughs> um, so, the, so the Media Lab, is, uh, 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 as you know, is a, is a, is a lab at MIT. It's, it's a fairly peculiar lab, even at MIT, but more broadly. Um, hi, Ethan. Um, and uh, uh, 
it's, it's sort of an unlab in many ways. Um, w one of the uh, first words that I learned when I got there uh, here was uh, during a faculty search, we were, we sa it said in the sort of description of the job, let me just see here, um, that we were looking for um, anti-disciplinary uh, people. And uh, what, what that means is it's not that our, our faculty don't publish uh, in uh, scholarly journals in disciplines or that we don't like people in disciplines, but there's a lot of space uh, between and beyond the disciplines. Um, one of our faculty members, Ed Boyden, often uh, talks about the sort of well-known adage that um, drunk people look for their keys under the uh, street lights because that's where the lights are. Um, but there are a lot of keys in the dark areas between the lamps, and Ed uses the metaphor of um, using a flashlight to go look for the keys where the federal funding and the academic journals don't shine their lights. And I think one of the key things that uh, the Media Lab tries to do is to help establish new disciplines, connect disciplines that are otherwise unconnectable. And, um, and we do this um, because we have a somewhat peculiar model where we have uh, 90 or so uh, companies that support us through consortium. So we have a real luxury of having discretionary funding to fund those sorts of things that wouldn't normally be funded. So we feel that's actually our responsibility. And we have 26 groups. Uh, they're in all kinds of spaces, like democratizing space, or synthetic neurobiology, or the future of the opera, or uh, um, uh, lifelong kindergarten, which is about learning. And so we're always looking. We're doing a faculty search right now. But we're always looking for uh, the other, the thing that we don't have, the thing that uh, the faculty member who couldn't get a job anywhere else, uh, who couldn't get funded anywhere else, but is still doing something hopefully uh, interesting and valuable. And so for us, um, a lot of scholarship is um, how do you have scholarship? How do you give uh, masters and PhDs and tenure in the department of none of the above? How do you, how do you measure it? How do you have rigor? Um, a lot of it comes from uh, you know, Piaget and then Seymour Papert and now Mitch's uh, ideas on constructionist uh, learning, which is really the, the, the art of uh, learning through doing. Um, and when you have an interdisciplinary collaboration between a psychologist and a roboticist and a, uh, uh, somebody from uh, the School of Education, you, you, can, you have a very difficult time having a academic conversation, but you can build something like a learning robot and you can see if it works and you can see how your discipline interacts with somebody else's discipline when you actually have a machine interacting with a human being. And so, so for us, part of the act of making um, does start to define uh, a way in which these disciplines can rigorously interact. Um, so, so for us, uh, the, 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 the publishing, the conversation, the making, and the iteration is, is, is one way we, we think about um, um, research and scholarship. Um, this is a, a, an image that uh, Neri Oxman, another faculty member at the Media Lab, uh, created. And um, it's not a new idea, but she, she did a beautiful job, so I wanted to share this. But this is really sort of the intersection between art, science, design, and engineering. And the way she describes it is that the upper half is about perception, and the other lower half is about production. And if you say the left side is culture and the right side is nature, and you can think about this as an intersection, or you can think about this as um, sh she was inspired by the Krebs cycle, which is a, a natural metabolic pathway. But if you imagine that science takes information about nature and converts it into knowledge, and engineering takes knowledge and converts it into utility, and design takes utility and transforms it into behavior or societal value, and that art takes uh, society and converts it back into perception. In the best of all worlds, then art should then feed science. We don't think it does that enough, um, but that's one of the missions of the Media Lab. But also just to think about whether we're talking about MIT, we're talking about scholarship in general, or we're talking about a single human being. Can you uh, live in or move uh, freely between these uh, four disciplines or four areas? And Rich Gold actually, uh, created a similar graph with his hats on that showed sort of what uh, he had, he, the different hats he put on. So that was inspired by him. But, but, I, but I, I don't think this is a, a new image. I mean, it's going to be the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus next year. And they have a very similar circle where they have the different materials they work with and how they're integrating craft and, and um, architecture and other things. So, so this idea of interdisciplinary work isn't a new idea. But I think that we, uh, it, it changes uh, depending on the uh, technologies and the uh, issues of the day. Um, so I think I, I'm an internet guy, so everybody, everything looks like the internet from my perspective. So um, I think internet is one of the biggest uh, things that has hit us, especially when we think about scholarship and publishing. 
I assume everybody remember before we had the internet when we had like fax machines and life was simple, when academic journals were really the primary way you actually got information between scholars. Um, so I call that before internet BI, when life was simple. So things were sort of Newtonian, sort of Euclidean. Um, and, uh, and if you remember, it was also when copying something was quite difficult. I mean, we had copy machines, but, but, but copying at scale um, required some sort of uh, enterprise. Uh, so it was really a business uh, thing. Um, and uh, when the internet happened, it's not artificial intelligence, I call this after internet, um, things became very complex. Um, copying actually became a thing that was not something that only businesses do. Every time you loaded a browser, uh, you were making a copy. Every time you scanned a book, uh, you were making a copy. So copying became something that used to be an enterprise endeavor to something that every single individual was doing. So, so that was one big thing, and we'll come back to that. But also, more broadly, I think it connected everybody in the whole world. So suddenly, what used to be uh, a very physical act of going to universities and having conversations, this whole idea of scholarship and the business model around transferring information uh, uh, completely turned on its head. And, and a lot of things turned on its head. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe a little bit about what I think the world of after internet is. Um, but I'll start with sort of my beginnings with the internet. This is a picture of my bathroom in the early 90s. Um, and this is the first uh, commercial internet service provider in Japan. And it's about uh, $1,500 of junk parts. And um, uh, it uh, uh, was the, the, a couple of key things. So one thing was that bef all of the networking protocols before this were the, the specifications for writing the software. You, could, you had to trundle around because they weighed huge uh, kilograms of weight. And so a bunch of students, though, with the internet protocols, because they were so lightweight, could write the software. The hardware was all mostly open. So that's a Sun, that's a Cisco AGS. And, and so you could sort of slap the equipment together. So it was the first time that a bunch of students um, could uh, compete in telecommunications with a telephone company. So, so in a way, I would call this open innovation. Um, and it, uh, it opened up what used to be controlled by uh, a monolithic monopoly. Um, the other thing is that because of this, it drove the cost of communications down because um, the, one of the first uh, online magazines was running on that server, and um, it, it's a used sun. And I remember when the hard disk, uh, or actually the fan blew out, and the hard disk stopped because it got overheated. We took turns blowing on the hard disk while one of the stu kid students went to uh, Akihabara to get another fan, and so the site went down, but it was mostly up. And this is what we called an internet best effort. And, but it was up 99% of the time. And in fact, if you could get a website to stay up 99% of the time with $1,500 worth of parts instead of millions of dollars worth of parts, well, that's actually maybe an OK trade-off. And that was the trade-off that the internet gave us, which was for a substantially lower cost, uh, you could connect all the time uh, in real time. And then you add to that Moore's law, which I won't insult you by explaining, but that the cost of computing went down geometrically. And so when you have low cost of networks and computing, then you get low costs of collaboration and distribution, which fuels experimentation because you no longer have to ask permission. You just do it. And free and open source software blossomed. And that includes things like Wikipedia, but what uh, Yohai Benkler would call commons-based peer production really took on uh, a new force. And, and so that allowed us to do a whole bunch of things including research, including scholarship, including building things and tools uh, without having a uh, huge uh, infrastructure and having um, permission. And there's a great book by Annalise Saxenian about, called Regional Advantage, where it shows the sort of shift of power from Boston to Silicon Valley as innovation was pushed to the dorm rooms and to the edges, and those uh, 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 rich and powerful companies and institutions weren't needed anymore for a whole set of innovations. Um, and to just illustrate with an example, so when the earthquake occurred in Japan, I happened to be in Boston interviewing for my media lab job. And my family was in uh, Chiba near the, close enough to the Fukushima reactors that I was concerned about radiation. So I reached out to a bunch of friends. Uh, Ray Ozzie had just left Microsoft, so he happened to be available. I was able to get to the guy who created the instrumentation after Three Mile Island. I found a guy who knew how to make Geiger counters. Uh, uh, I found a woman who had been making a website to publish uh, radiation measurements. And, and we were able to sort of kludged together a really interesting uh, ragtag team of people who were interested in trying to figure out how to measure the radiation and publish it. 
And one of the things we quickly figured out was that there weren't any Geiger counters left for sale. We tried to figure out how to build them. We eventually end up designing a Geiger counter on our own. Um, we put, but if you look, it's mostly op open parts. So it's a Pelican case with Arduinos. And so there's some proprietary stuff that we had to build, but mostly we were able to slap it together with sort of hardware equivalents of free and open source software. Um, and then uh, we also realized that the limiting factor was the sensor. There just weren't very many. They were being created by a company called LND in New York. So we went mobile. So we created a mobile unit that fit on cars. And uh, we called it, it looked like a bento box. We called it the Big ID. And we drove around Japan with volunteers and donated cars. And in, in the end, um, uh, we were able to, we've so far been able to collect 80 million uh, readings. And initially, all of the scholars were poo pooing us. They were saying, Where's your scholarship? What are you trying to do? Are they calibrated? And, um, and the government was trying to discredit us. Um, but today, most of the scholars who were poo pooing us have joined us. Um, we're being invited, we're publishing in scholarly journals, we're invited to a lot of international conferences. Um, all of the NGOs and the government efforts to try to sort things out uh, that were planned before the earthquake failed, basically. And even now, the government has asked us, after years of trying to uh, uh, discredit us, now have asked us to validate their measurements because citizens trust our measurements more than they trust the government's measurements. Um, and it's become uh, a quite a, a successful citizen science project. And, uh, and we have lots of conferences. And, and some of the, the folks don't even like the name citizen science because it sort of seems to differentiate between real science. Um, and uh, the, the, the interesting thing is when we've discovered a lot, um, we, we did make mistakes, but I think we're now considered uh, an authority in a, a couple of, um, uh, of, of segments. And, and, and what's important about this, I think, is that first of all, uh, this is, in my book, I call it pullover push, which uh, is a riff off of um, John Seeley Brown and John Hagel's book um, and, and Lang Davidson's book, um, The Power of Pull, which is the idea of pulling things from the network as you need them, which ties back to scholarship, which is do you want to stock a whole bunch of paper books or do you want to be able to download the la latest book? Do you want um, to be connected to people or do you want to be connected to things? Um, but this idea that you could start right after having knowing nothing about um, radiation earthquakes to be able to build what is probably the most successful um, open hardware and uh, radiation measurement project. Um, and so it's not just uh, physical things, uh, information, but physical things are also the innovation cost is going down, the innovation is being pushed to the edges. And I would say it's happening to biology as well. So um, Nicholas the other day in his usual poetic way came up with the phrase, bio is a new digital. And it's not that it's literally the new digital, but just like in the 90s when Nicholas uh, joked that newspapers would be delivered over the internet and everybody laughed. Um, I think it's similar where we think everyone will be involved in biology and um, people are laughing. But um, synthetic biology is becoming quite accessible where uh, snippets of genes are being uh, sequenced and turned into little bricks uh, that look like programming code that you can sequence, uh, p assemble, and put into something like a bacteria or yeast and reboot it and then you've got um, biofuels and pharmaceuticals and many other things. Um, this is a few years ago now, but in my kitchen, uh, we were designing uh, uh, a bacteria that would create biolacin, which is a really expensive uh, 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 possible um, anti-carcinogen. And uh, we were able to uh, design it, assemble it, uh, uh, transfect it into a bacteria, reboot it, and have the bacteria actually create biolacin. And this would have been very difficult to do. Actually, I think there was a, a, a local ordinance that says I can't do this and uh, I won't do this again without getting the proper permit. But normally, this would require a proper lab with a lot of equipment. We just have a bunch of junk parts uh, designing and, and, and putting together bacteria. Um, and this is happening at scale. So this is iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition that's a spin out of MIT. 4,000 kids, high school, college, that bring their uh, genetically engineered uh, uh, microbes together for a competition. Um, silly things like um, dog poop that smells like winter mints to fairly sophisticated things that like um, microbes that might be able to help find landmines. Um, but the thing is, this has become uh, um, a high school garage thing. Uh, Obviously, you know, it's a little scary. Um, the FBI sponsors a lot of the meetings. Uh, Ed Yu from the FBI is very integrated with this community and it feels like he's been able to get at least a substantial portion of the community more concerned about um, making sure that the world is safe than um, trying to stick it to the man, which was the problem that the FBI had with the internet folks. Um, 
but the tools are getting cheaper. So you're starting to see kits that you can buy that in your home um, very easily uh, used for uh, uh, things like uh, um, uh, designing new bacteria, creating new things. So, so it's becoming, um, we, we, we use the word street bio or citizen bio, but again, the idea that it's a separate uh, thing from academic uh, bioengineering and research is, is starting to uh, disappear. And uh, uh, we have a, a famous course at MIT that Neil Gershfield teaches called How to Make Almost Anything. There's a new version that he, they're doing with George Church called How to Grow Almost Anything. And it's sort of a how to make class for, for biology. And they are now broadcasting it um, and um, have a global network with a fab network and making it available to people all over the world. Um, but there are a million life science papers a year. First of all, you, you can't humanly read a million life science papers a year, but most of those papers are uh, published under lock and key, and most of the kids who are participating from developing countries have no access to the academic papers. So this is really stifling uh, the ability for uh, non-institutional uh, researchers in, in, in bioengineering. Um, but I, th I think, you know, it, so, so, so we have, I want just to wrap up that thread. So we had, with internet and software, uh, innovation and research being pushed to the edges because the cost of collaboration was diminished. And it sort of made sense with digital stuff, but it turns out it's true with hardware because the designs and the distribution of hardware can start to get pushed to the edges with a diminishing cost. And now with biology, we're starting to see the, the experimental tools as well as information getting pushed to the edges. What's not keeping up is the academic publications, the 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 uh, hardcore scholarship um, has a hard time interacting with this system, not partially because of the style in which uh, the interactions occur, um, but also uh, the, the copyright and the, the publishing mechanism. Um, also being at a university, I want to talk a bit about um, learning and pedagogy. So our kids are, um, have phones, and I know some parents don't let their kids use their phones. And my 10-month-old is just we're trying to figure out how much time she should be in front of the phone. But, but it, in the long run, we have phones, we have Wikipedia, we have tools in our pocket. And um, my concern is that um, our educational system isn't really uh, keeping up with this uh, changing environment. So this lecture style, this could be 100 years ago, this could be uh, today, um, is still sort of the trend, the, the sort of, even when we talk about um, MOOCs, we're still doing, in many cases, this thing. And um, uh, I'm not sure if that's the right way to do it. I, I, the reason I don't have a college degree partially is I was just, I think, spoiled and um, um, immature. But part of it is that I felt like they were trying to get me to learn the whole encyclopedia from A to Z in that order without, before I got to do anything. And I really like to do things. And so, so that was very frustrating with, to me. That was very much a push rather than a pull. Um, but uh, when I got to the Media Lab, I realized, well, there are other people with the same affliction. Um, we, we did an experiment years ago now um, at the Media Lab where, so everybody knows a polygraph test, which is a lie detector. It's basically measuring your neural arousal by looking at your galvanic skin response. And Ross Picard at, in Affective Computing made a device to um, put a similar device on a student. Um, and it was able to measure um, for a period of a week um, the neural activity of a student. And if you look at this, it's kind of fun. So you've got like study, obviously lots of brain activity. It turns out sleep, sleep onset, there's a lot of brain activity during sleep onset. Class is, if you notice, it's kind of, it's pretty flat, right? Um, it, it, my, 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 favorite, my favorite is that it's actually flatter than relax. Relax is harder, but once you got a real professor, you can go into that deep, deep um, flat line state. Um, and uh, um, so, <laughs> I can send you the image, Chris. <laughs> but 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 the, but one of the things, first of all, I, this is kind of a funny slide, so I show it. But I don't think this is new. It's probably been like this forever. We can just now measure it. But I think the idea that a lecturing talking head is the right way to deliver uh, knowledge and understanding and creativity and inspiration. I, obviously, there are great professors. Many of you are probably great professors, and it's not like this. It's probably not just one professor at MIT, <laughs> but, but, um, but there are other ways to do this. And one of the things that um, the Lifelong Kindergarten Group uh, stresses is this idea of creative learning. And so they talk about the four Ps, projects, peers, passion, and play. So the idea, and there's, there's a lot of pedagogy around this too, uh, that, uh, and this ties to constructionist learning, which is that um, you learn better when you're doing something and that 
transferring knowledge from a textbook into real learning or real application is quite difficult. And that learning with peers uh, is actually, uh, in many cases, works better. Um, teaching is a great way to learn. Uh, kids seem to, in many cases, retain things they learn from other kids better than they retain them from um, authorities. Um, passion, uh, you know, this is, this is my sister ended up studying uh, uh, learning and, uh, and anthropology because she couldn't figure out how I was able to survive. So she labels me an interest-driven learner, which is sort of what you do if you follow your passion and you learn in the pursuit of passion. And, and in Finland, for instance, they're doing some experiments where they're doing project-driven learning rather than um, um, uh, 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 discipline-based, and, and there's the unschooling movement. Montessori is very much like this. Um, and, then, and then play. Um, and play, I think, is, a, a, again, an interesting area where um, you know, pressure and financial rewards are quite good at um, getting people to do linear thinking. But for creative thinking, it's, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, a feeling of play um, is uh, a, a significant contributor. And when you look at uh, modern schools, what you have is you have uh, textbooks, by yourself, passion we can't measure, and play is during recess, and they're preparing you to be on top of a mountain with no phone and just a number two pencil all by yourself, um, is kind of the, the scenario in which uh, you're being trained for, where, which isn't really the case. You're most likely to be in a argument in a bar with your phone and Wikipedia, and you're not gonna be arguing over facts, you're gonna be arguing over other things. And so, so to me, I think the world has changed and we need, to, we need to upgrade, especially if you imagine that uh, machine learning and other things that are better and better at doing robotic tasks are uh, uh, coming and training our kids to be robots is really not the right way to do it. So with that, I'm gonna pivot um, because I think one of the key things about passion peers projects and play is working with each other, collaborating, sharing, building on each other's work, which is one of the key things uh, that we were concerned about at Creative Commons. So I was on the board for a while, I ran the organization for a while, but this was trying to address the problem of um, the internet suddenly creating an ability for us to share and collaborate, but having copyright fundamentally making it uh, illegal to do many of the activities that the internet um, allowed, but also the companies who are protecting their assets uh, with copyright, Hollywood, um, academic publishers, um, and uh, and you know, and legitimately authors who relied on on, on their uh, copyright revenues. And so, the idea of Creative Commons was a way to mark your works with the uh, permissions you wish to grant. So, if you wanted to grant just non-commercial rights, or if you wanted to grant uh, rights. To, of any rights with attribution, you could label them. Um, initially, this was seen as a very uh, 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 disobedient and counter societal act. I remember giving a talk at a uh, European uh, publishers meeting and the first comment after I shared the vision was from a publisher, Finnish publisher, who said, your comments are disgusting. And so I think it's gotten, the world has changed where even Elsevier has um, Creative Commons licenses on their website. Um, ASCAP still um, has a whole web page about the evils of Creative Commons, so not everybody has been converted to the notion that, um, that we're, we're, we're actually trying to provide choice um, rather than trying to convert everybody. But, but anyway, so, so the idea about Creative Commons was could we set up a way so that um, uh, people who wanted to share their works could share their works. Um, to get a little bit into the weeds, um, in the Millennium, uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, there is a, uh, 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 a section of the law that um, provides for the circumvention of copyrighted technology to be a felony. So, Chris, if you gave me a DVD and said, here, use my talk from this DVD uh, in any way you like, here's a license for it. Um, if I were to rip the DVD um, and take the content out and extract it from the DVD, which has a uh, copy protection technology, that act uh, is actually a felony. And um, it's very similar to money laundering and other uh, laws that try to prevent the thing that allows a crime. Um, and, but it's, it's, it, it, was, it was used quite heavy-handedly he, heavy and is still used um, um, in many ways that prevents research and so on. So, so it's, it's, still, it's still an issue. Um, um, Sci-Hub, which many of you probably know, I think it started in 2011, um, Alexander, uh, Alexandra Elbakan uh, created this, I think she's Ukrainian, but um, it's, it's a website where you can download just about every academic uh, 
journal article, uh, uh, period. And uh, many publishers are now, uh, have, have filed a lawsuit. Um, there uh, is a, a claim, which is probably accurate, that um, it's, it's significantly impacting their revenues. Um, but, um, and, and I'm not going to make any judgment on this, um, but, but, but the thing that's interesting to note is that um, it has suddenly made academic um, journal articles available to people who wouldn't otherwise have them. And so you see, if you look at the top 10 users, the top is China, the second is India, but interesting, US, UK, and France are also in the top 10. So, um, you know, uh, people in our country, either because of convenience or because of the copyright issues, are using SciHub. Um, I know we have librarians here, so I'm sort of maybe just saying the obvious, but, but the, the cost of licensing uh, academic journals continues to increase. And even Harvard, I think, reduced their uh, uh, licensed journals by 30%, I think. Um, and there are certain um, universities that have just um, dumped, uh, I think there was a, a university in Germany that um, stopped Elsevier completely because they just can't afford it. So, so even the m richest university in America can't afford all of the journals, which is somewhat crazy if you think about the fact that the journals are really kind of the lifeline of academic uh, interaction. And the, the, the other kind of interesting thing is there was a, a, a University of Pennsylvania study done that showed, so I think in the 60s, up until the 60s, you had to actually file uh, uh, the copyright every year to retain it. And so there are journal articles from that, that should be out of copyright because they didn't file. Um, they're still noted as copywritten. Uh, my friend Carl Malibu did a, a study recently that showed that, um, so there's a law in the United States that federal employees' uh, work should not be copyrighted, but there are also, uh, oh, I think, over a million articles that are listed as copyrighted in these databases. I am sure it's accidentally, partially, but, but even uncopyrightable materials are often in databases noted as being copyrighted and prevented from being downloaded by people. Um, so, so I think SciHub's an interesting thing that shows a demand for this knowledge. And, but if, I mean, I'm, I'm on the board of MIT Press. <laughs> I, I think about it from the perspective of the publisher. And obviously, somehow you need to pay for all of this stuff, the peer review, the publishing, and it just can't go out for free, um, even though you know, I think Tim Berners-Lee hoped that the, the web would do that. Um, there are some interesting cases, though. So if you look at the Berne Convention, um, which is from, I think, 1889, um, uh, which is sort of the basis of copyright law, there is an exception in here, for, um, illustrations for teaching. So it says, um, uh, the extent justified by the purpose, uh, literary works by way of illustration for publication, broadcast, da, 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 for teaching, uh, there, sh there could be an exception. Um, it was tested, interestingly, um, and there's an act, uh, I think in 1950-something in, in India, and India has a code uh, which comes partially from the Berne Convention interpretation, partially from their constitution, that says that uh, acts, uh, not to be an infringement of copyright uh, by teacher or pupil in the course of instruction, which is quite interestingly broad. And so this was tested recently uh, in uh, 2016 when a bunch of police went to shut down the copy office at the University of Delhi, that, uh, Delhi University, where they were making the course books for uh, classes. It was shut down and uh, slapped with copyright infringement, but they contested and they were, they one in the high courts in uh, India, and the high courts ruled that this uh, copyright exception for uh, using material for instruction uh, should be upheld, and that distributing photocopied uh, uh, journal articles in class was not a copyright violation, which is pretty interesting. So my friend Carl Malamud, who runs um, Public Resource, and he's, he's an old copy fighter. Um, he's the guy who put all the patents online, and, uh, and then everyone went after him, but then it eventually turned into Edgar. And so, so he says, okay, well, well, why don't I get a copy, um, not directly, but indirectly, of the journal articles on Sci-Hub, put them in a briefcase, which this is the first time this image is in public, uh, and head off to India, which he has done. And so Carl is now in India with a copy of just about every academic journal article on hard disks, and he is trying to figure out a way to legally make all of the journal articles available. He's not gonna put this all online. Um, he's gonna make them available to university students uh, under the guidance of the courts in India. So this is a pretty interesting experiment. We're not sure exactly where it's gonna go. He's literally in the process of getting this operation set up. Um, and uh, and there, I think, you know, as far as I can tell, um, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, um, but it does seem like a, a legal endeavor, and I think it should inform us. Um, and it might be an interesting thing to at least study how this plays out in India. 
Um, so going back to the position of the publishers, so, so at MIT with Chris and, and, and Amy, we're working a lot on open access publishing. I don't think I need to describe it, but the idea is that many of these publishers take your copyright and the, even the faculty themselves can't publish the, uh, or distribute the article. So by uh, getting uh, the right to do open access, whether the journal is open access or you pay for open access, you can uh, publicly share uh, the journal. Um, and we have this thing called the APC, the Article Processing Charges, which is, uh, um, uh, um, I want to use politically correct, it is uh, supposed to correlate with uh, the cost of publishing the article. So the idea would be, and even with non-open access articles, the, the author or the institution can be charged for publishing the article and by paying a fee, so for instance on Elsevier, I think it ranges from $50 to $5,000 per article, depending on the journal, you could pay to have your article become uh, open access. Um, and so basically the idea is that you're paying the cost or cost plus and that that somehow um, uh, frees uh, the, the, the uh, article. I think the big question is, does it really cost $5,000 to publish an article? Uh, what is the plus and cost plus? Um, but at least there's a, there's a path, and thinking about open access uh, uh, articles and article processing charges is a way to think about what the lever for making the world, or at least a substantial part of the world, open access is something to think about. Um, and so uh, this is the Media Lab logo and the MIT Press logo. Um, and so we are doing a collaboration with MIT Press. I'm a little bit conflicted because I'm also on the board of MIT Press. But we're doing a, a publishing futures group, which is uh, uh, not a lab, but acts like a research group. Um, and it's an initiative between the, the two institutions. And we're trying to do experiments and transform publishing um, and trying to figure out how to do a community-driven uh, system as well. So, so not just open access, but how can we engage a broader community from citizen scientists to cross-disciplinary groups. Um, and I think it's the first uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, first, first of this kind of collaboration. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is uh, developing a, a platform called PubPub, which uh, one of our graduates, Travis Rich, has been working on. And this is really sort of an author-driven uh, online model where many of our faculty members are now launching their own sort of meta-journals and bringing other people in to have conversations and collaborate. It's also very multimedia where you can have data and video and code. And so we're experimenting with the platform for publishing in, in addition to the copyright. And, uh, and then <coughs> lastly, this is... Uh, building on the, uh, the history of open access at MIT Press, which uh, includes uh, previous publications like City of Bits, um, and uh, more recently the, the online version of that um, called, uh, what was it called, Frankenstein Annotated Scientists, Engineers, and Creators of All Kinds. And, and oh, the online book is called Frankenbook. And um, we're, so we're experimenting with PubPub. We're using it for books, we're using it for journals. Um, but the idea is that there is both a technical and a publishing component of this lab, and we'd love to uh, work with you on that. And with that, I'll end, and if you have any comments, questions, uh, feel free to call my comments disgusting if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I can, I can do some questions, yeah. Back to your comments about Creator Commons and, and giving uh, authors, creators choice. Was there? Do you have thoughts on whether or not the more distinction should be made between creative works and your mention of, of ASCAP sort of creativity, uh, music, fiction, art from reporting and factual uh, uh, documents, which, which I would put into academic publishing, and whether or not the same uh, copyright law should apply equally. Yeah, so, so I, I have an opinion. Um, the law has its own opinion, um, and, uh, and different countries have different opinions about the law. So I think you know, if you see the most extreme case, and I can't remember now which is which, but some countries view, if you take a photograph of a public domain document like the United States Constitution, uh, the photographer has the copyright in some countries, and in some countries they don't. So even just the reproduction uh, is considered a, a uh, 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 creative work, and so so that's quite extreme. And so you're fighting against uh, uh, a legal interpretation where making a copy, uh, a literal facsimile, is considered some form of creativity. And so so we 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 obviously uh, in the United States have a, a, a fair use, which we don't have in um, um, 
in uh, civil law, many civil law countries in, in Japan and other places where you really articulate like how many centimeters and da da da. Um, and fair use is interesting because fair use is really the right to argue that um, this was uh, uh, used for a purpose, how much creativity, and you, you can argue things. Um, the thing about the courts in the United States is that um, because, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice, but, um, but because we're um, common law, if the practice changes, the law changes. So one great example of sampling uh, was okay, and it was considered a thing until the, the record labels started suing, and then people started paying for samples, and then they were able in court to push over uh, sampling and turn it into something that became um, a copyright violation when previously it hadn't. Um, there's a great section of the uh, Chicago Manual of Style, which um, uh, I wish I had here to quote, but they, they actually um, say to their uh, readers that uh, 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 fair use is an important right that we have in America and that um, you have to fight for it. And that, in fact, asking permission when you don't think you need it may not be a good thing. Um, and this is in the Chicago Manual of Style. I, I hope it's still there. It was in the last, last, the last edition that I saw. So, so I think that at least in the United States, you can and should argue that um, certain categories of things like parody and other things aren't copyrightable. Facts are not copyrightable. Um, recipes are not copyrightable. So there's a whole set of things. If you, but to your point, if it is a fact, it's not copyrightable. And so, so you should, I think you, we should exercise that, that. And places like MIT, where we have not s super deep pockets, but enough deep pockets to be able to defend a faculty member or, or a student, I think we should be standing up for uh, what I believe is a really important right in the United States, which is, which is fair use, which is, I think, the, 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 the foil I would use to try to get to your point. Yeah. But yes. Um, thanks, Joy. A couple of things to follow up on. One is this notion of facts, and this is a contentious area around depositing data, whether it's scientific data, humanities data, because you know we can argue. People have been arguing for centuries about what is a fact. <laughs> so that enters into this. So sort of your thoughts on sort of that malleability of the notion of facts. Um, and the second one running in is that privacy and copyright are starting to intersect in some very interesting ways, um, and I'm going to talk about this a bit in a few minutes, uh, but things like the, the new GDPR coming up, and you know, I know you're not a lawyer on this, but it's going to change the way things can flow across borders in some interesting ways. And do you have any thoughts about how you know, both the malleability of facts and the changing nature of border controls and data might help us think about the next steps? Yes. Um. Yeah, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, it turns out I am a visiting professor of law from practice at the Harvard Law School, so I, I play a lawyer in class, <laughs> but, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, but we do, we do think a lot about GDPR and about privacy and about databases. And um, first of all, I think it's really interesting to look at what we call neighboring rights, which are the, not the copyright, but the rights associated with various things around copyright. So for instance, in Europe, you have very strict database rights which uh, says that uh, the data may be facts and the data may not be copyrightable, but the assembly of that data into a database is actually protected under database rights. And so uh, at the Creative Commons, we did a thing called CC0, which was not a license, but actually a way to the extent possible under the law, waive all copyright, which we found was really important when you were working with large amounts of data. You didn't want to have to give attribution to every single person that contributed a point of data. And so for instance, with SafeCast, with our radiation measurements, we use CC0 so that you can actually use the data. Otherwise, you'd have to provide attribution, which is the Creative Commons license. Uh, I think that privacy and copyright are really interesting in that I'm a strong proponent of copyright. And I think GDPR is an excellent first step in kind of starting to think about how uh, we should protect uh, 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 citizens' rights. Um, I think the use of copyright as a way to enforce uh, uh, privacy, and I'm very biased here because I'm a very much an open copyright person, but a, a uh, uh, protect the privacy of citizens, increase transparencies of, of those in power, which is the opposite direction that we usually go. Um, I think that's really important. I, I, would, I would be much more supportive of using other tools to protect privacy than using copyright, because I think copyright is sort of the wrong tool. I mean, copyright comes from 
um, you know, licenses that the, 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 the throne in, in, in the UK was using to sort of give license to their friends. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it, the provenance of that, that law is just the wrong, it's the wrong place to come from. And so I think GDPR is a good way to start uh, thinking about it. Um, but, I, but, I, but I do think that it's really interesting to watch the Europeans, and there's, I think pretty soon in France, there's going to be a, a, uh, uh, an event where they're going to sort of, they've been doing a, a long survey on artificial intelligence. And uh, one of the really interesting things, because of the privacy regulations in, in Europe, they have a hard time collecting data to train machines. And so they're trying to figure out how do we join the AI, uh, um, whatever you want to call it, the AI, uh, 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 thing, yeah, <laughs> revolution, um, uh, without being able to train our machines. And so I think that in a weird way, Europe may figure out interesting tools like uh, differential privacy and, because um, so, I think trying to figure out technical ways to do things like train machines or to uh, uh, filter for things without spraying private information all over the place, which is sort of the default in America, um, is, 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 is a great, Thing. And I think Europe will be forced to think about them in ways that the Americans haven't. I, I think that, that uh, I don't want to keep going too far into this, but just the one, there's a great paper that I'm, ha I'm happy to po po post onto the site, but of, of the use of FICO scores right now um, for marketing. And there's a law that says credit bureaus aren't allowed to use personally identifying information and sell it. Well, they're selling household information, saying it's not personal, and they're targeting um, um, uh, these marketers are targeting um, extremely, uh, 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 what do they call them, predatory uh, uh, ads to these households. And, th and that in the United States, just because it, it may be legal, it's okay, it's kind of crazy. And then they're now using things like social media to create credit scores, and people are using credit scores for hiring decisions and mortgage decisions. And I don't know if you saw the, the Spotlight article from November, but in Boston we have the, the mean uh, asset uh, value of a African American is eight dollars, and the mean asset value of a white person is two hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars because of access to housing uh, purchase and so, or homes. Because this includes the homes, and so, so you have these systemic biases in America that are now being reinforced by the sort of um, use of, of data in appropriate ways. So I think I think I lean very heavily right now on trying to figure out ways to um, uh, protect not just protect data, but to try to prevent the generation of algorithms um, that reinforce uh, societal bodies. Sorry, I rambled. <laughs> Anyone else? As far as open scholarship and citizen science, um, it's a question of authority, and, and mm -hmm. one of the things that makes it back to fact um, is uh, peer review um, and the authority that blesses it as a fact. So it's, it's, it raises it an interesting question of it. Uh, Citizen Science Project comes up with something, proves something, makes something work, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same. It doesn't have the same yeah. protection as a fact. That's something that is uh, peer reviewed. Yes, and I think one of the things, and this is something Amy has been working a lot on, is alternatives to traditional peer review. So one of the things that you can do on PubPub is you can invite. Uh, people to come and review your paper. So instead of a traditional blind peer review system, I could click and have eight people that everybody trusts read my paper and comment, and I can version up based on their comments, and then it would be a kind of pull peer review. Um, uh, in the case of the citizen science work, um, we, we do end up um, going to academic journals for some of our papers to sort of anchor them uh, so that then we can um, uh, validate it. But um, it reminds me of Bruno Latour's uh, Science in Action, which it really talks about peer review as really kind of the social phenomenon. And so the extent to which the internet is changing the social network, um, I think it's kind of interesting to think about, like for, for instance, Wikipedia is a really weird uh, category of peer review. It's sort of the peer review that if it survived the scrutiny of the internet, it might be true. Um, versus uh, we talk to three experts and they think it's true. And it's a really interesting uh, uh, struggle, but I think in the current context of where the internet is, um, I'm not as bullish on everything on, that survives on the internet is true as much as I was a little while ago. Christy. Yeah, I'll give the, the last question. So since we don't get to have you in the room for the next day, um, so, some of what you mentioned are uh, things that you think technology can solve, things that you think uh, 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 legislative change can solve. What are some things that 
research could help us solve. So what are the, you know, the goal here is to come up with some research questions to solve some current challenges in open scholarship. What are some you would lay on the table for us? Well, the point from just now about peer review. So what, what are alternatives to, to traditional peer review that allow us to get to a sense of voting on something, whether something is true? Um, there's a, a lot of uh, peer, and, and, and what is it that's being peer reviewed? So, so we, we have a real lack of sharing of data, um, and we have this often now touted the reproducibility problem, the problem that academic journals tend to publish uh, successful results, uh, the fact that even pharma companies uh, f um, publish successful things, but they sit on troves of unsuccessful clinical trials that would be extremely valuable. So, so there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff like data, and there's a bunch of process like uh, what is it that's being reviewed in what way that I think uh, we could think of technical ways to make them better. I would push you to think a little bit about incentives. Um, and so we, this never worked out, but one idea that we had at one point was um, for material transfer licenses, could you give the people who are sharing the materials or maybe sharing data credit when their data or material was used for something valuable? And could you list it like an attribution? Um, are there ways to give uh, people credit that gives them incentives both to maybe um, uh, show uh, that uh, uh, studies are, are, are wrong or to show that, um, I mean, and this is also another problem we, I find with the, the patent system that we have right now. I mean, the patent system was designed for the garage tinkerer, so it's uh, very cheap to file a patent, very expensive to overturn one. It's the opposite now. We have big companies that are stealing ideas from sometimes from our students. And what you find is it's very expensive to overturn and it's very cheap to make, so people are filing patents like crazy, you could easily reverse that. You could say that, um, and this is an idea that I got from, uh, uh, I sh probably shouldn't say the person's name, but, um, <laughs> but somebody in the government, which was, um, you should get a bounty if you overturn a pa patent. You shouldn't, ha and it, you shouldn't have, your, your, your legal cost should be covered, and if your patent's overturned, you should pay a penalty. And I think they, the patent office still has this idea of the garage tinker, but that's not the majority of patents. And so, um, so I think there are ways to change both financial incentives as well as sort of uh, uh, reputational incentives to try to get uh, peer review and validation better. Um, I, uh, I, I think that, I mean, this is sort of tooting our own home, but the, the, the idea of figuring out ways to have more emergent publishing because I think the energy and the cost of starting an academic journal, getting peer review is pretty high. Um, but, um, but then also, um, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, this other meta thing, this is where machine learning, I think, comes in, is, is I think there's going to be a lot of machine-to-machine -machine, uh, facts and knowledge. You know, I think there, there's a, a, a researcher in Japan, uh, Hiroki Kitano, who is, who is his, his half-joking goal is to create an AI that wins a Nobel Prize in 2050. And he's now trying to make a machine ingest all one million life science papers to figure out what the interesting questions are and then get humans to do little bits of research but then continue to try to track and figure out where the best uh, Nobel Prize ideas are. But the, but the idea that we're, we're exceeding the ability for a human being to ingest all the papers in their field is kind of an interesting problem that maybe machines might help with. And, and that's about things like landscaping patents. It's all, also about... Um, creating ontologies. I, I wouldn't go down the rat hole of trying to do a complete sort of handmade semantic web, but, but I do think that there are ways, for instance, one of the things that uh, uh, Hiraki is working on is English is a very fuzzy way to describe biological processes. You can read things in many ways, and so there may be a machine-readable precision that you could do, whether it's the documenting of an experiment or the explanation of an exact interaction between molecules that right now when it's written by human beings is very fuzzy but could be um, better. So maybe machine assisted paper uh, writing and paper parsing could be another area. Maybe building on this, um, I mean, I've, I've read that when automobiles came out, basically people putting gravel in those pathways and horses and carriages and automobiles and things were sharing those pathways. And the realization came that that can't work. They're both modes of transportation, they all move infinitely better, let's pay roads and so on. Larry Lessig has written that when commercial air travel was coming around, mm -hmm. farmers owned the air above their properties. Mm -hmm. You can understand how difficult that would be in terms of transactions, so they just did away with it. So to some extent, I'm kind of asking, how much do we begin with the current state of the art as a starting point, or do we just have 
the green space. Yeah. I'm going to be now very political <laughs> because this came up quite a bit when we were fighting uh, uh, for copyright uh, related things. But um, so when you look at the history of America, there are many cases where the commons trumped personal or commercial interests and things like the airspace to uh, support the budding air travel, uh, you know, made sense. Um, but I think ever since we've become somewhat neoliberal uh, and this sort of uh, capitalist democracy that we are today, um, commercial interests like Hollywood or, or uh, you know, any large commercial interest, it's been nearly impossible to extract um, uh, uh, some, any asset from that constituent in order to support the commons. And I think, um, and academia and research, I would put in that space. And so, so I think there are some great ideas of what we could do. You know, we, we, we could make it so that copyright, uh, so one example that, that Larry posts was great is that the original idea that you had to like send in a ping every time to keep your copyright was kind of cumbersome, so they took it away because it was not fair. But the internet makes it so that if you have a website and it's programmed to send the link to the copyright office every year, that's not too much work. And that would take the over 90% of orphan works that we have now where you can't copy because you can't find the copyright owner because they're not around. But we have these orphan works because we continue to extend copyright. Um, and so, so just things like, okay, you can keep your copyright as long as you pay a dollar a year. I mean, that, that would take a whole bunch of stuff um, out of copyright that'd be tremendously useful. But, and, and it doesn't really cost anyone really that much. But it's like these negotiations where they just don't want to give an inch. I, I don't know if this is still true, so this may have changed. But I remember when I was working with Creative Commons, the US government had uh, its, this weird license where um, it's public domain for Americans. And so if you want to download a NASA image in France, at least at the time, this may have changed because I was fighting it, but then I left before I ended the fight. They said, oh, well, you can't download it in France. It's only free in America because it's American taxpayer money. And then I tried to get the, uh, make it so that the, each of the agencies could waive their international copyright. And the uh, 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 GSA, uh, the government uh, agency that's in charge of the assets, the lawyer said, no, international rights for American uh, 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 federal uh, things are, are American assets and the agencies do not have the right to waive the value of those assets. They're on my balance sheet. And there's this, there's, so there's a lot of like, e even ridiculously um, uh, 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 obvious things um, have become very hard politically to, to fight for. So, so I do think that that's, that's true, but I think it's more of a political fight than uh, winning an argument because there are a lot of arguments that I thought I won, but I didn't get anything from them. One last. Um, Mary Mena, I, I just need to add that we've signed the burn treaty, uh, the U.S. has signed that, which for, says that we can't have any kind of a burden, uh, like paying even a dollar. So if we want to continue as part of that treaty, we, we can't. Oh, uh, so it's part of the burn convention. I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, that, that makes sense because 18, wait, but isn't it until 19, so this is where I show that I'm really not a lawyer. Isn't it, wasn't it until the 60s there was some sort of rule that you had to register? Even if you didn't pay? We didn't sign the Burn Convention until uh, Oh, okay, that's why, yeah. That's why, and that's, that's why we changed, actually. I see. That we no Interesting. Had to, okay. So, had to do the renewal. So, that, so there we go, that's the reason. <laughs> but we could go back and redo the Burn Convention and say now that we have the internet, maybe all countries should pass a law that says that if you are unable to identify the copyright owner, I mean, the, the Orphan Works thing, I think, is sort of a maybe low hanging fruit that we might want to try to do. Um, well, thank you very much, and thank hope you, so you have a fruitful day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. That ends our live stream, and for those of you in the room, we're going to take a 10-minute break and reconvene in this room in 10 minutes. So, thanks. <laughs>